Uh, welcome uh, to this panel on 21st Century Community Policing. Uh, I'm Lori Robinson, a former Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice. I'm now teaching at George Mason University, and I'm really uh, delighted uh, to welcome you uh, to this session. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the University of Pennsylvania's Fells Institute of Government uh, for hosting uh, this event. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Fells has been educating students uh, for close to 80 years uh, with the knowledge and practical experience they need uh, to be public leaders uh, prepared to meet the evolving challenges of today's world, uh, which are certainly many. Uh, and I wanted to ask Dr. Nelson Lim, who is the director, executive director of Fells, if he can stand up and we can recognize him. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, sadly, I don't think when Ed Rendell asked the Fells Institute last spring to, sp to sponsor a program on policing uh, that he could have envisioned that this issue would be still as front and center as it in fact is today. Uh, and certainly when the president asked uh, Chuck Ramsey here and me 20 months ago uh, to co-chair a White House task force on 21st century policing in the aftermath of Ferguson, I know neither one of us uh, could have envisioned that these issues would still be so central in national debate as they are. But it, clearly these tragic events of the last two weeks in Baton Rouge, in St. Paul, and in Dallas only bring an even greater sense of urgency to addressing these problems in our justice system and more broadly uh, in our society. So the, ch the challenges here are great, uh, but we do have a very stellar group with us here today to address them. And it's my pleasure uh, now to introduce uh, the group to, to you. Uh, and starting off is my old boss, who is sitting right here to my left, uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder, uh, who served, as you know, as our 82nd uh, Attorney General. Uh, now, Eric Holder uh, needs little uh, introduction, though I've had the pleasure of introducing him probably, what, 30 or 40 times. And, and Eric, I kind of miss doing that. Uh, he had the longest tenure of any individual as Attorney General but three others in our country's history. And his service at the Justice Department capped a, a long career in public service. First as a line attorney in the public integrity section in the Justice Department, then as a judge in the Superior Court in the District of Columbia, as the U.S. Attorney in D.C., as Deputy Attorney General, uh, and then, of course, as the Attorney General, starting in 2009. Uh, as the Attorney General, he spearheaded a number of initiatives in areas ranging from prisoner reentry, sentencing reform, and voting rights, uh, to same-sex marriage, environmental issues, and community policing. While he's now returned to private practice at Covington and Burling in Washington, I know his heart really remains with this work. And I will tell you that it was very much the highlight of my career uh, to go back to the Justice Department uh, to work for him. Now turning to... <laughs> now turning to the remainder of the panel, and I'm going to be quite brief with these introductions because I want to leave lots of time for the panel. Uh, I'm going to jump around here uh, and start with Charles, or Chuck Ramsey, who has over 45 years of experience in law enforcement and, of course, was the former police commissioner here in Philadelphia as well as in Washington, D.C. In 2014-15, he co-chaired, along with me, the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Uh, he is immediate past president of two of the major police leadership organizations in this country, the Police Executive Research Forum, PERF, and Major City Chiefs Association, 
the only person to have ever headed both of those organizations at the same time. Now, if you ask folks in criminal justice who are the two top two or three police practitioners in this country or in the world, I will tell you that Chuck Ramsey's name is going to be on that list. So delighted that Chuck Ramsey is here with us today. Now at the far end is Karen Freeman Wilson, who has been mayor of her hometown of Gary, Indiana since January 2012, and is the first female to lead the Steel City and the first female African-American mayor in the state of Indiana. Now she's also served as the state's attorney general and the director of Indiana's Civil Rights Commission. And I also want to note that she's played an important national leadership role in a number of settings. For example, as head of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals in Washington, which is where I first got to know her and really noticed her, her stellar skills. She's also been an active player with the US Conference of Mayors including chairing an important group on these issues rela relating to police reform. So welcome, Karen. Thank you for being here. <laughs> now sitting next to Eric Holder is Chris Magnus, who's been chief of police in Tucson since this January and previously served as chief in Fargo, North Dakota and Richmond, California. And I will tell you, in Richmond, Chris Magnus was a star. Uh, he earned real kudos for his significant involvement in strengthening ties between the community and the police department. And Richmond had really uh, had a number of challenges uh, in that community. Uh, Chris was credited with bringing down both violent and property crime. And community support for the department substantially improved during his tenure. Chris, thank you so much for traveling all this way to be here. Uh, and finally, sitting right in the middle, uh, we're joined by Brittany Packnett, who also served on the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Uh, Brittany is Executive Director of Teach for America St. Louis, and this fall will also transition uh, to become Vice President of the National Community Alliance for Teach for America, which among other things is responsible for setting the organization's national civil rights agenda. But she's also played a role as an active protester and activist for issues of racial and social equity and has served on the Ferguson Commission. And this past year joined other activists to release Campaign Zero, which as you may know is a policy platform on ending police violence. I also would note that any time I've been at the White House in meetings that have involved the President, Brittany seems to be there and oftentimes is sitting right next to him. So Brittany, we're glad you're here sitting with us. So I want to uh, jump right in now and challenge our panelists. Uh, and we're going to do this, this whole panel with quick responses. Uh, we know uh, you, you, you're very busy at this convention, um, and a very good lunch here, by the way. But we don't want you to be sleepy after lunch. So we're not doing long, um, long speeches. You probably want to drink the iced tea so you have some caffeine to keep you going. And it's a very bright, lovely room. And by the way, we're going to have Q&A in a little while, so get your questions ready for this uh, good panel here. Um, and I want to start out with this. We're just two weeks away from the second anniversary of Ferguson. And as we know, we've just gone through this terribly difficult July with the events in Baton Rouge and St. Paul and Dallas. All of you all on the panel bring somewhat different perspectives today from different communities and some, some different parts of the justice system in, in part. What do each of you think are the crucial steps that can now be taken moving forward to build 
or rebuild bridges between communities and law enforcement? Or do you think trust has been irrevocably broken by these recent uh, tragic events? And let me underscore here, I'm asking each of you to do this in a five minute snapshot each. Uh, Eric, I'm gonna start with you, and then just to give you a heads up, Chuck, I'm gonna go to you next. Okay. Well, I think there's a, a basic framework that um, we ought to, I think we can all agree on. Uh, and it's something that for me was a guide in my work as Attorney General, that there is not a tension between the notion of keeping police officers safe and making sure that people in law enforcement treat the people they are supposed to serve um, with dignity, um, in, an, in a just way, um, and fairly, that we can do both. It doesn't mean that um, we shouldn't examine what's going on in both of those areas, but one, but those two things are not in tension with one another. And uh, it seems to me that unless we understand that, we can't really address the problems. Uh, my brother's a retired police officer, and I remember he used to say that, you know, Cops have the right, this, and this is his expression, and maybe it's maybe one that used in law enforcement, I don't know, he, he used to say, cops have the right to go home. Uh, you know, just a, kind of a basic thing. Cops have the right to go home. Now, you speak to my brother, on this, by, at the same time, he would say that um, he saw things in law enforcement, in, in the way in which police officers treated um, people in communities that he thought um, was inappropriate, appalling even, and was concerned about the almost reflexive nature of people in police not to share information or not to um, take to task those who had engaged in these inappropriate um, activities. Uh, you know, I, I, in my trip to, to Ferguson, um, I think, and it's, hard, it's hard to believe it's two years ago at this point, um, I, I thought the interesting thing there was that we had an, an investigation to decide whether or not an officer had uh, broken the law. And then as we got out there, we realized that there was something else going on in Ferguson, and that was the relationship between um, the community and the, the criminal justice system. I don't want to put it just on the police officers, but between in, in the criminal justice system. And if you look at that report, that report that we issued about Ferguson, which I described in the, in the press conference when we released it as, as a searing indictment of uh, what had been going on in Ferguson, a determination had been made, as, in essence, to fund the government on uh, the backs of uh, largely poor, um, largely people uh, of color through the use of the criminal justice system by you know, pulling people over for traffic stops, um, bringing them into court if you didn't show up exactly on time, then you had contempt um, charges were brought against you, arrest warrants, the fines went up, and people could never get out of that, um, out of that vicious cycle. And that bred a distrust between the community and people in law enforcement. Um, I think that um, given what we have seen in other parts of the country, and, and uh, Richmond would be one of the places I would certainly point to, that um, the issues that I think presently exist, and we have to admit that these, there are problems in, in the relationship now. Um, there is a, a trust deficit, I'd say, right now. But I don't think that is something that can't be fixed if we're honest with one another um, and look at the way things are now, but also understand the history that exists um, for people of color, for communities of color, and the way in which law enforcement was used um, too frequently as a tool of oppression. And I think if you understand that background, um, and if you're honest about um, the present, and if people come to the table um, with, uh, with goodwill, and I, and I think that you find people, both in the community, activists, and people in law enforcement who are inclined to do that, I think that progress um, can be made. Progress has to be made. Thank you. Chuck? Well, thank you very much. I don't have a, a lot to add. I think that uh, the Attorney General kind of laid out a lot of the um, framework for our discussion moving forward today. But let me just say, say this. I, um, I started my policing career as an 18-year-old police cadet in Chicago, 1968. And for those of us in the room that are old enough to remember the 60s, it was a pretty uh, turbulent time, no question about it. And for a young African-American male to decide to become a member of policing was um, in itself quite challenging. I recall 
uh, more than one person in my neighborhood. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a community called Inglewood, which uh, to this day continues to have more than a share of challenges. So the most popular thing I could have done in um, the eyes of some of my, um, my, my buddies uh, was certainly not becoming a police officer, but I chose to do that anyway. <clears throat> But I remember what it was like then. I mean, we didn't talk about community policing. I never heard the term. I mean, if, uh, if you had a problem, you, 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 you dialed the police, we responded, and we, and we dealt with it. I mean, the community was just looked at as being eyes and ears, nothing more. If there was an uptick in crime, just hire a few more cops that will suppress it, we'll take care of it, and we move on. It wasn't until the, the 1980s that this, this notion of community policing, where we actually worked in partnership with community started to really, really take hold. Um, but then something, um, something happened in the late 80s and early 90s when crack cocaine um, took over many of our communities and the homicide rate and aggravated assault rate just started to soar in communities across the country. I know in, I think it was 1991 or two that New York had like 2,200 murders uh, Chicago had close to a thousand uh, murders, and city after city was experiencing the, the same thing. So um, everything became: let's get tough on crime, let's crack down, let's let's you know let's get a handle on this thing. And as a result of that, police started you know flooding communities, particularly communities of color, where some of the violence was taking place, and you started to have a disproportionate number of people being arrested and put in jail for a variety of, 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 of reasons. But then something else happened with technology. Beginning in the late 1990s, um, we started getting more sophisticated in terms of our ability to be able to identify quickly crime that was taking place, where it was taking place, and deploying our resources accordingly. Been referred to as putting cops on the dot, comp stat. You've heard a lot of different things um, being um, uh, used to describe it. But we started moving away from the community policing concept that most departments had adopted in the, in the 1980s. And we started becoming more reactive and just dealing with crime as it was occurring. And I think in, in hindsight, that was the beginning of the erosion of relationships in some of our communities, not all our communities, but in many of our communities. Because trust starts with knowing one another. You have to have relationships. And if you don't have relationships, you're not going to really have any, any real trust. Having the same officers working in the same community all the time, getting to know the people in the community, understanding that in the most challenged community in any city in this country, there are more decent law-abiding people living there than there are criminals. There are more good kids than there are bad kids. But when you, when you listen to the radio and all you're doing is going from 911 call to 911 call, robbery, murder, rape, uh, ag assault, crime scene after crime scene, what starts to happen? Your perception of that community starts to shift. And you start to think that, hey, I'm in a very dangerous environment. People in this neighborhood are very dangerous. I feel threatened. So you become hypervigilant and you make stops on the street you make stops based on that fear, and fear is something we don't even talk about in policing, but we gotta start talking about these kinds of things, because we are human beings. Anxiety, you know, uh, the Attorney General mentioned, you know, uh, cops have a right to go home. I admit that, but everybody should be able to, to, to live after an encounter, period. Everybody, it doesn't matter. Everybody should leave <laughs> with their life. And so, you know, we've got to, we've got to shift back to basics, and that is getting to know the people we serve. Technology is a double-edged sword. You know, because of these videos, the viral videos that have, that have really kind of taken over, it really has done more to change the perception of policing than any single thing that I can think of during my career. Now, there's good and bad to that. One, any misconduct on the part of a police officer ought to become known and ought to be aggressively investigated and the appropriate actions taken, period. But I also think that we need to keep things in context, too, because what the videos don't show us what led up to a particular incident. They show the incident itself. And so we need to be able to, 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 to you know, be, be balanced and have these things in context if we're going to get at the, uh, the real issue as to what took place. Under no circumstances should a police officer 
engage in the use of excess, like excessive force. Under no circumstances should you use deadly force unless it is absolutely the last option available. You have no choice. You know, there's two sides to everything. I served here as police commissioner in Philadelphia for eight years. I had eight officers killed in a line of duty. Five were shot to death. So there's some real issues that we have to deal with. It's not just about police and the use of deadly force. It's about violence, period. It's about how we've been overrun with guns, with drugs, with all these kinds of things. How, how uh, you know, our educational systems have failed our young people. I mean, it's a complicated issue. But let me just say this before I close. There's been a lot said about Black Lives Matter and, and organizations like that. I see them as legitimate. Now, you've got extremes, but you've got extremes everywhere. I mean, so extremes on the police side, extremes in certain movements. I mean, so let's forget about the extremes. Let's deal with the folks that genuinely want to see change. Here's the danger. Right now, the nation's attention is focused on police, accountability, uh, violence in general. Um, but we live in a society where people have short attention spans. That window for change will not be open forever. We've got to be able to get this done now. We've got to be able to have the kind of discussion that we need to have. We need to put in place those systems that will Weed out folks that don't belong, and we have some folks that don't belong. Weed out those people in the community that don't belong because they're there to do harm, not to build and, and to be a positive part of a community. But it does not last forever. And right now, everybody's fixated on these videos. It's like everything else. It'll come a time when people get desensitized to the videos as well because that's the kind of world we live in, folks. So now is the time. Police, you, you got the attention of police. No question about that. You got the attention of the Department of Justice. You've got the, the attention of a population of people that historically have always given cops the benefit of the doubt, but are now saying, wait a minute, something's not right. It ain't fair. That's that group that's going to really be able to push forward positive change, or at least help uh, mm -hmm. do that. But we won't have their attention for long if we don't do the things that need to happen right now. It's, an, it's a challenging time, but for me, it's an exciting time. Because unfortunately, in order for change to really happen, usually it takes a crisis. It's a shame, but it's true. We have to take that crisis and turn it into opportunity to build better relationships, stronger policing, better, stronger, healthy neighborhoods and communities so that our kids can grow up and thrive and because that is the future of this country. And uh, with that, Lori, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to you. Um, wonderfully said, Chuck. Brittany, let me turn to you. Can these relationships be rebuilt? Is trust there to be rebuilt? I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and engage in this conversation. Uh, you know, I came into um, protests in Ferguson on August the 10th, 2014. My first protest, though, was when I was in a stroller. Just <laughs> um, <laughs> how I was raised. And, um, but I, I also came into the task force not necessarily knowing a great deal about policing as a profession, but knowing a great deal about being black and marginalized in America. And the first time in my family that I remember experiencing police brutality was when my brother was in the car with my dad, and that car happened to be a Mercedes Benz because my father happens to be an Ivy League graduate, but of course all the officers saw was a black man in a nice car that couldn't have been his. And so what my five-year-old brother witnessed was his father being pushed up against the hood of a car, cursed at, yelled at, um, beaten up um, uh, in uh, one of those tiny municipalities that sits right next door to Ferguson in North St. Louis County where I grew up and where I still live. And so 
this idea that um, this this very true idea that the attorney general has already spoken to that the history of policing and of law enforcement has always been in great contention with people of color, especially black people in this country when you think about the roots of plantation policing and policing being used to control the black body, that is deeply rooted, right? But there are lots of things that have been deeply rooted in America that we have found a way to persist through, right, and, 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 and overcome. And so I engage in these kinds of conversations because I remain hopeful about the answer to your question, Laurie. Um, and, you know, for me, this kind of issue wasn't new. Um, but I think, uh, to Chief Ramsey's point, it is new to a lot of people, right? There's a, a CP, CBS and the New York Times recently did a poll, um, and someone who was interviewing me wanted to say, well, you know, Americans are seeing race relations as, as bad as they were in the 90s when Rodney King was beat up, right? And I said, let's look closer at the numbers, right? Because all Americans are not new to this. There was only a 4% increase for African Americans in that poll, but there was a 15% increase for white folks in that poll, right? So now that we have this moment, now that we have this momentum where people are finally awakening to the things that we're, we've been talking about for a long time, we see this engagement in democratic protest, we see an increase in civic engagement in weeks like this, and what we are urging in the activist community and in the activist collective that I'm a part of called Campaign Zero is the idea that justice will keep the peace better than anything better than a militarized police force, better um, than uh, being heavy-handed in over-policing communities that are challenged from the top down, right? That justice, environmental justice, educational justice, housing justice, employment justice, right? Justice in issues of poverty, um, justice in, in juvenile issues, that if we, from the bottom up, create strong communities such that people are no longer living on the margins. We don't have to have conversations about what happens when we're over-policed from the top down, right? And so that is truly the approach, right? That justice will always keep the peace. And what we are in search of is not a temporary solution. We're talking about true, true and active presence of justice, right? Not just the absence of crime, which I've heard you say before. Um, and so what that looks like in a lot of ways, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the Campaign Zero platform, is we've looked at a couple of things. One was data. We realized that as people were finally becoming aware of the story, it was important that people knew that Michael Brown and Walter Scott and Sandra Bland were not just incidents and individual incidents, right, but were a part of a trend that is as old as time in America. And so it was important for the numbers, the names, and the stories to be out there. Um, but we've also focused on issues of training and Hiring. As you just said, you know, I my background is in education. Um, there are great teachers that come from all backgrounds. And not only do I have to train you well as a teacher and continue to develop you to see your biases and how they affect your life in the classroom, I also have to hire really well. I have to make sure that I'm looking out for those things that could be troubling in the classroom before you ever enter it. Um, we also are deeply focused on the demilitarization of police. You know, in the in the last two years, um, I was hopeful about the kinds of more civil responses that peaceful protesters had been met with around the country. And then two weeks ago, I ventured down to Baton Rouge, where I witnessed over 200 people get arrested unduly, um, where I witnessed a young woman continue to cry and tell the officer standing across the street from her, all I have is a sign, why do you have an assault rifle? And so there's no need for this kind of occupation in our communities, especially when we we know that it antagonizes the issue, right? It doesn't actually bring us to a place of transparency, justice, or peace. It continues to antagonize the issue. Um, and lastly, we put out a report on a piece that often we overlook in this conversation, which is the role of police unions. Now, I want to be clear. Right, that I am the grandchild of a labor organizer, that I was a member of the Washington Teachers Union when I taught in DC, and I fully believe in uh, collective bargaining. However, there is a place at which we surpass due process and we actually start to create a shadow justice system for police officers. I believe that if you are a public servant, a teacher, a firefighter, a police officer, an elected official, you have to be held to the very highest standards of our democracy because you have decided to engage in that profession, right? You are the professional. And so in that case, we want to ensure that there is due process, but when you overstep those lines of due process, like in Louisiana, the officers that killed Alton Sterling actually have a window of up to a month before they are interrogated. 
right? And also under state law there, they can have access to some of the evidence in that case before they're interrogated. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have a month and access to evidence when there's a case pending against me, I can invent a whole lot of things in that time, right? And so when you talk about issues of trust, I don't really trust you if I know that you've got a whole lot of time to invent that story, right? When there's a lack of transparency and oversight, and when you are treated very differently than I would be if I were to assault or to kill someone as, a, as an everyday citizen, right? And so it's actually not just Louisiana. There are 13 states and 50 cities that uh, impede and restrict interrogations in cases of police killings, right? And so at our, on our website, um, uh, joincampaignzero.org, you can see that police union contract project. You can see where we FOIA'd the 100 largest, con uh, the 100 contracts of the, um, the 100 largest police unions in the country um, and actually combed through every single stipulation and found things like what I just talked about because those things create that shadow justice system. They impede justice, they impede transparency, and they continue to deepen those wounds of distrust, right? And so it's important that we continue to pay attention to that layer as well, but I'll end with where I started that truly justice is the thing that will keep the peace. And that's what we're continually in pursuit of. In this movement, we know that police violence is the branch of a larger tree, a tree that's rooted in systemic racism and oppression. And so what we're focused on is all of that and all of the things that branch out of that tree. But most certainly, we have to be alive to learn, to work, to play, and to grow. And so that's why we will continue to be here, continue to engage in these conversations, and continue this movement. Uh, thank you so much, Brittany. Karen, you bring a somewhat different perspective as a, a city mayor, and also your perspective from having led the U.S. Conference of Mayors a group that looked at this panoply of issues uh, from that perspective uh, from mayors around the country. First, um, let me thank you, Lori, and, and the Pensfeld Institute for the opportunity to be on the panel. And, um, you know, in answer to your question, I, I would, from a mayor's perspective, say that the trust in our communities is not irrevocably broken. I would also say that um, we have an incredible amount of work to do. And any time there is a tough job, um, you always know that you have to have all hands on deck. And so I think to um, Brittany's point, and to use that analogy, certainly uh, justice is always an answer. I term it in a different way and say that to the extent that we have gone from a discussion about public safety to a discussion about community policing, I always like to refer to it as community restoration. Because when you talk about it in those terms, you almost take the focus off of, take the honest off of, take the burden off of the police and you place it, I think, where it belongs on the community, the entire community. And so while certainly whenever you're talking about safety in a community, you want to talk about the role and responsibility and the hiring and the training and all of those aspects associated with law enforcement, I think that there is a large role that mayors, that county commissioners, that other electeds play in how one approaches what is happening in the communities. What do you say when something occurs that may not be fatal, but may still be intolerable? How do you talk about the importance of who's on your police force? How do you talk about uh, the role of the community in public safety? Um, what do block clubs, what do neighborhood watch associations? 
Um, what is the role of the larger uh, justice system in what happens after the arrest? Because that is so important in developing, establishing, ensuring a trusting relationship between the community and the overall criminal justice system. Those are all things that I can talk about and that I have a responsibility to address when I see that it's not right. Now, that's not going to be very popular. When things are not uh, as they should be, for me as the mayor to say, because there's always this uh, inclination or there's always this effort to get people to choose sides. Well, I'm on the side of the people. And so to the extent that I'm on that side, if something isn't right, I have to say it, but if something is right, I have to be willing to say that. And so recently, we saw folks, you know, have a, a real problem when there were mayors and there were elected officials who spoke, off, uh, who spoke out on behalf of those individuals, um, Mr. Castile and um, his colleague down in, in Baton Rouge, uh, the young man in Baton Rouge who were killed, and who also said that the killing of police officers in Dallas and Baton Rouge was in fact wrong. It's not either or. Both of those situations were wrong and required us to speak out. And I think at the end of the day, it's really about using our bully pulpit as mayors, as community leaders who, are, who happen to be elected to pull everyone together. Because the business community has a role to play in job creation. The educational community has a role to play and in changing the narrative that starts very, very early. And if we are able to pull all of those individuals, all of those entities together, then I think you begin to change the narrative and then create a new paradigm from which the community relates to the police and the police relate to the business community and the business community relate to everyday people so that um, you, you do develop a restored community that's able to move forward. Uh, thanks so much, Karen. Uh, and then wrapping up, Chris, uh, you obviously made great strides in Richmond, California in bringing community together with law enforcement. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you asked the question, is the relationship broken? Is it irretractably broken? And the answer has to be no. It has to be, because if we subscribe, even if we go back to what Robert Peel taught us about policing, right, the idea that police are community and community are police, we have a relationship that has to be mended. And there are ways to do it. And, and this isn't just sort of talk that's out there, platitudes. There, there's a real blueprint, I think, for trust building in our communities. And we need to be clear, and we got to take the high ground on this. That, that blueprint, it does not compromise the safety of either the officers or the community. In fact, quite to the contrary, it makes police officers safer in what they do. It, it does not compromise our ability to fight crime it actually can reduce crime. And this is not an issue that is liberal or conservative. It should not be left or right. This is a matter of pragmatism, of doing what works to improve safety in our communities. So let, let's talk about that blueprint for a second, because I'm, I want to just 
you know, my job as a police chief is to really be a change agent. I, I guess in some ways I think of myself as a community activist cleverly disguised as a, as a police chief. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always go over so well in the police department, but that's okay, I'm the boss, mm -hmm. so that I've got a little bit of an advantage there. But there's a blueprint that, that I ha had the opportunity to work with a great team of other police folks as well as community folks to put in place in Richmond, and we're, we're working on much the same process in, in Tucson, even though they seem like very different communities. So first of all, let, let's acknowledge that there is absolutely no substitute for real engagement between police and community, and that has to go beyond just the police chief talking to those who identify themselves as community leaders. I can go out there, as I did at one point in Richmond, and have folks say to me, Chief, we really like what you're saying. You're, you're, you're talking our language. You are saying what needs to be said. The only problem is my son or daughter is interacting with your line level cops and their experience is a little different than what you're describing. Okay, so we've got to do better than that. We have to figure out how we build this level of engagement right from the line level all the way up to the top. Yes, it requires leadership, but it also requires training, 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 supervision, hiring the right people to make sure that that engagement starts with the rank and file. And the engagement has to go beyond what police have always done pretty well, which is sort of that concept of, you know, national night out, we interact with people who already like the police, who feel comfortable with the police, who are the police cheerleaders. No, we, we gotta meet with our critics. And we have to acknowledge that a lot of those critics in particular are young people and they are communities of color where we have had a very fractured relationship. And we have to help our, under, our officers understand that by acknowledging that fractured relationship, that is not an indictment against them or the work they're doing now, but they need to put that in context if they're going to understand that black lives matter, if they're going to understand where we head going forward. So we must have greater outreach. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things is cops have to be trained on how to actually listen. We are so good at prescribing, at telling folks what they need to do, how we're going to keep them safe. That, that paradigm has to be turned upside down, and we have to train our officers on how to listen and give them the tools to do that. That means training in things like identifying unconscious bias, which is critical training for all police officers, understanding the tools that come with learning about procedural justice. These are things many of you may not understand that in the typical police academy in this country, cops are learning a lot of tactical skills. And don't get me wrong, they need those skills. But they need so much more. And the top skill that they need, which is communication, is the one that they probably get the least training in. So we have to work in that area because if you're gonna be a better collaborator and partner and if you're gonna build trust, you have to be a better listener. We also have to look at how we assign police. Chief Ramsey said it exactly right. Cops have to be assigned into neighborhoods where they have geographic ownership and where they are given the time and where there is the expectation that they are going to build relationships. And they need to be told what does that look like? It means getting out of the car, being given the time to get out of the car. If you're one of the electeds in this room, this is where you need to help because we have allowed police to become the servants of the 911 call machine. And it has to go beyond that. Police have to get out of the car, they have to get into schools, they have to get into churches, they have to get into businesses, they have to go to community meetings, and they have to be trained on how to engage in those situations and then be given the time to really build those relationships. The next part of the blueprint has to be transparency. And I almost hate that because it's a buzzword now. And I'm so tired of buzzwords because transparency has real meaning if it's applied. And that means, for example, what kind of complaint process do you have in your city? How hard is it to navigate? How much time does it take? How well the, and welcoming does the police department do in explaining that to folks and making it available to them? Is there independent oversight that works effectively with your department's professional standards unit? 
What about data? We've talked about data. Brittany made reference to that. But we have no process for shared data locally, at a state level, even nationally. We've got to do much better in this regard when it comes to how we track use of force, police complaints, even just basic crime data. We have so far to go. And then how do we share information with each other? Every department, there should be an expectation that all departments are fully engaged on an active social media platform. That's not the whole solution. There's no substitute for face-to-face -face engagement. But young people in particular are looking at social media, and we have to step up to the plate. If we're not texting with people, we're, we're missing an entire generation of folks who want interaction that way. And then finally, we really have to do better with the segments of our community that are the most vulnerable, where we find so many of these tragic interactions occurring. So that means a much better approach to training and addressing calls and involving folks in mental health crisis. Departments at the very minimal level should have first aid mental health training for every officer. If they're smart, they've gone on beyond that to CIT training, for at least as many officers as they possibly can accommodate. That's a 40-hour block of training on what to do and more importantly, what not to do with folks who are in a mental health crisis. And then hopefully they're building collaborative relationships between a select group of officers who can go out proactively and interact with folks who we know are at high risk for encounters with police because of mental health situations. And we can team that, those officers up with clinicians and experts that can really help you know, deal with some of these problems before they occur. We also have to be much better in terms of training, giving officers de-escalation strategies. We talk a lot about use of force, but until officers have the tools to actually use de-escalation, and they know that and it has to be more than just yelling at somebody, stop resisting, okay, that's not actually the de-escalation strategy we have in mind, we're going to continue to have problems. And we have to recognize that police can be involved far more effectively if they take a humane, services-oriented approach to folks who have drug addiction or who are homeless, again, very high-risk populations. So these are all pragmatic solutions. Again, this isn't about right or left. I, I'll be honest, maybe I shouldn't, this is the wrong crowd to say this isn't even Democrat or Republican. This is our full community. But the nice thing is we do have some tools available. So let me give a plug, because I didn't hear them give it, to these folks who are involved in the 21st Century um, Policing Task Force. If you have not looked at those recommendations, and if those are not on the discussion table with your police department and your community, they should be, because that, it, that lays all of this out better than anything we can describe here. The other piece that I would really encourage that's, I think, a transformative part of the process is the Police Executive Research Forum, PERF, that Chuck was the very capable uh, board chair for many years, um, is, is the work that they've done around guiding principles on use of force. This is critical and should be something that is discussed in every police department in this country. Um, so there are tools out there. There is a blueprint that works. The question is, do we have the will and follow through to take advantage of it in this very critical window that I thought was laid out? We have a window. The question is, are we going to go through it and make these changes? Uh, Chris, uh, that was terrific with your specificity. I thought, thought that was great uh, to wrap this segment up. And because he mentioned uh, the White House Task Force report, uh, and thank you for doing that, uh, if you are interested in finding that on the web, it's easy to Google Policing Task Force, uh, and you can find it immediately. One of the things that Chris mentioned was the subject of uh, social media. And I actually want to turn for the next subject for the panel to the issue of the media. Uh, you know, in these highly charged situations and cases, you know, emotions are running high, uh, and there are often a lot of strong views expressed about how the media behaves in these situations, including social media, whether it's actually positive or negative. 
whether the media is acting responsibly, whether it's a kind of provocateur, whether it's biased, or whether it's actually a helpful tool uh, to uh, police departments, for example, or potentially to protesters, I assume, in conveying their message. So I want to turn and get the panel's views on this, and if they have any specific examples in mind of where the media was helpful or not helpful, uh, would be interested in, in their thoughts on this. And Karen, I want to start with you as a public official. Obviously, you interact with the media all the time. Any, any experiences that you've had that might be helpful here? You know, um, the media can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And, and that's just a reality of um, not just life around policing, but um, life as we know it as elected officials. I always say to people, I don't say or do anything that I don't want to see on the 10 o'clock news. That's just how I live. But when you do it in, and, and look at the media in this context, I think that um, they are, there's a heightened awareness in our community. And so there has been a heightened awareness whenever there is an interaction between police and a member of the community that may be seen as um, controversial or not. Similarly, there's a heightened awareness when a police officer uh, is killed uh, by a member of the community. And so, you know, there are, inst are times when there is clearly a, uh, a fuel to a flame scenario with the media where they jump to uh, or rush to conclusions, they rush to judgment, there is an effort to um, portray it a certain way. I mean, you know, when you look at cable news, gone are the days of this um, impartial media portrayal. That just does not exist anymore. At the same time, I think it's important, especially when you're working uh, with social media, to acknowledge that that can also be a useful tool for departments, for uh, those of us who are elected officials, for those uh, in the community to really convey a message, whether that message is, you know, I'm aware of something that's going on, I'm aware of this interaction as the mayor, I am investigating it, I am committing to making sure that the community has access to the information, to the truth, all of that can be conveyed through social media. Now, you know, you can't always get a message into 140 characters, but it's, you know, you're not just dealing with Twitter or Instagram, but you also have Facebook. You also have other means of social media. And certainly the most important thing that I can do as an elected official is to, as soon as I have all of the information or as much of the information that will allow me to make a responsible statement to make that statement rather than simply hiding behind or uh, going to a fallback position of I'm not going to say anything until I have all the information. You may never get all of the information but there's also a balance that you have to achieve by using uh, as much of the information to communicate with the public and, uh, and provide that transparency that, again, causes people to more likely than not trust rather than uh, distrust the, uh, the, the member or, or the elected official. Uh, Eric, I know you have had just a little experience with the press. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> I think the media, in, as in most of the things that they do in this area, it's a mixed bag. I mean, they perform a very useful service in disseminating information and making, for instance, this country, um, white folks in this country, aware of what black folks and other people of color have known about many of these subjects for a whole bunch of years. And it is through the taking of those 
tapes and videos, uh, and then putting them on the evening use, news so that they're broadcast and people, it's brought into people's homes, into people's consciousness to say that, see, they can see that it, it's a validation of what many people have said for, you know, for far too long and who are not taken um, as, as speaking, speaking the truth. So I think there's, there's a value in that. On the other hand, as I, I think the mayor was saying, when you get to, to cable news, I, I think that, um, and I, you know, I'm a progressive, so I look at MSNBC differently than I do Fox. Um, <laughs> but Fox, um, you know, will use um, instances to, to justify um, a view that they have and do it in, I, I believe, an unfair way. Uh, you know, I, I see some of the, the commentators um, on Fox, and, and I, you know, I see Donald Trump um, exploiting a situation that we ought to be identifying and trying to deal with, as opposed to exploiting it um, for either ratings purposes or for political gain. And so I think the media in that way um, does not perform a, um, a good service. So I'd say, as I said, the media, I think, is a, is a, is a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Brittany? You know, a couple of things, um, a few things. You know, there was this, you just reminded me of this joke that um, that Chris, I think it was Chris, no, it was Dave Chappelle told it, right, where um, suddenly Newsweek started to cover the, the phenomenon, as people called it, of driving while black, right? And he was like, white people were sitting in their living rooms going, honey, did you know they were pulling black people over like hotcakes? <laughs> <laughs> and we were all like, yeah. Um, but, but there is, I think, a, a relevancy about, about that joke and about what you just talked about, about diversity in newsrooms, right? Because we have to pay very close attention that the folks who won Pulitzers for their coverage of Ferguson were young people of color, right? Wesley Lowry is the young man of color, right? Joel Anderson from BuzzFeed, person of color. Yamish from, from uh, uh, USA Today and, and the New York Times, people of color, right? And these were the folks who told their editors something is happening in Ferguson and you can't just you can't just ignore it, right? And you can't not put any resources into it, right? And so these were folks, some of them had to defy their editors to actually step foot onto the ground and then they figured out that there was a story, right? And so there's no possible way you are telling the full American story if your newsroom does not look like America, right? And so I think that's critically important for all of us to remember in our positions of influence. Um, and, and that means that as activists, there are certain folks that we will say, these are the people that we'll talk to, right? Not because we're being rude, but because we want to give the, we want to help those folks, editors, understand that they have credibility in our space, right? We want to be able to resource them with our stories because we trust them. We know that our stories will be told accurately, and we know that if we can help provide that cover and that credibility, then they will have more space to tell these stories further, moving further and forward. Um, and so integrity and diversity in newsrooms is, is critically important. When I think about Fox News, you know, there was a study that came out um, that, that shows us that the majority of folks that watch that particular station only watch that station, right? And so, again, when we talk about... <laughs> right, I know it hurts, right? So, so I, I flip between multiple stations. I flip between multiple websites. I flip between multiple radio stations. Quite frankly, I get a lot of my news on Twitter because it comes out faster, right? And... Yet, some of us are having a far more diverse experience than others are choosing to have, right? There's one station that plays in certain homes all day long. So there's a very serious question about how you have a diverse conversation with people who won't change the channel. Um, especially when that station, in my opinion, is giving free advertising to fascism, right? And we want to talk about a police state. No, I'm... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, my button says stay woke. That's the only thing I know how to do. We talk about protesters being able to tell the truth in public. I'm in public and I'm trying to tell the truth. What I am talking about, right, and what we heard last week was the threat of a police state. So if we don't feel safe in this context about policing, if we're having these kinds of challenges in this context about policing, let's be real with ourselves about how challenging it can get, right? And so 
I, I worry about media when it refuses to to your point um, to your point, Mr. Holder, about when it refuses um, to show any other perspective and engages only to prove a point, right? Engages only um, um, in in a certain bias that they want to continue to pursue. The last thing that I'll say though is that to me is the reason why social media and new media is so critical. You know, I remember uh, several cable news stations. Um, after the no indictment announcement of, of Darren Wilson, um, uh, reporting that people were once again, quote, looting the McDonald's on West Florissant Avenue in Ferguson. But what actually happened was that people had been tear gassed, and after three months, four months of protest, we learned that it is not water that helps you take care of tear gas, it is milk. And the only access that people had was to milk was inside the McDonald's. So people were trying to clear out their eyes after dealing with the militarized police force once again, right? And the only way that we could tell the truth about that story was people got on Twitter and corrected them and hold those, held those, those uh, news stations accountable. And so we are able to tell the truth unencumbered and in a way that is unrestricted in social media. Um, and that I think is, is something to your point that all institutions are wise to get on board with because that's where the conversation is happening. Which isn't to say that everything that we find in this new media is accurate too. Also. All right, let's, also. let's keep that in mind as well. Everything you see on the internet ain't true, folks. Also. <laughs> This is, and, and that's one of the greatest risks, right? There's sure. also a, a legitimate risk of the re-perpetrating of trauma because the videos of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile auto-played on a lot of people's um, uh, news feeds when they didn't want to see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck or Chris, do either of you want to weigh in on this? Well, the only comment I have on that is that, uh, you know, the days of Walter Cronkite are long gone. <laughs> uh, you know, especially with cable news, you don't have journalists, you have personalities. Uh, that have shows. And I think we need to be able to sort through that because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about spin as much as it is anything else. And so we have to be sophisticated enough to kind of sort through that and kind of get at the truth. And that's why getting to uh, something Chris said earlier about uh, if you're talking about policing, transparency becomes even more important because we have to be able to be in a position to get information out, accurate information out, so that people can actually see what's going on. Now the balancing act is you don't want to compromise an ongoing investigation, but there's a lot of information that can be made available to the public. Um, if you have a situation like we had, for an example, the Boston bombing. I mean, you had a major network, cable network, that said that we had people in custody, or that Boston did, and it wasn't true. And Boston had to correct that. And Boston PD did an excellent job in terms of of using social media to keep the public informed. I thought Dallas did a good job uh, recently when they had that tragedy down there. So it can be leveraged, but you know, the one, the one thing about social media, and again, we have to be sophisticated when we read these things and try to verify. People don't have to vet the information before they put it out there. They just put it out there. And so you get a lot of rumors flying too. So sometimes you get real good information. Sometimes you get information that's not so good. So it's up to the reader, to the person, to be able to kind of take that extra step to try to find out what actually is going on before you react in a way that may not turn out to be um, appropriate based on the issue. I mean, one thing, uh, just a quick 30 seconds here. Um, there was that report about the apprehension of the, the bombing, the Boston bombing. I was the Attorney General of the United States at the time, and I was watching that channel that I won't, even, I won't mention them because it was very embarrassing to them. I was watching this and I was thinking, boy, no one's told me that. Um, <laughs> so I dialed up Bob Mueller, who was the head of the FBI at the time, and I said, Bob, do we have anybody in, in, in custody? He said, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> and in fact, it wasn't true. This is after this station had quoted, I guess, three or four federal sources who said that, you know. Well, if you and Bob Mueller didn't know, I guess you could have concluded it, didn't, it wasn't real. But, but then sometimes you were the last person to know things in the Justice That's also true. We tried to keep things from you, That's Eric. That's also true. <laughs> also true. Now, we're, we're beginning to run a little short on time because I want the last 15 minutes. I have a number of questions here that have been turned in from you all. Uh, but I, the last question I'm going to put to you all, we know that there are like 18,000 state and local law enforcement agencies at the state and local level. So, you know, policing in this country is really a local endeavor. 
It's not at the federal level. But what should be the federal role in helping support a change in this area, if any? And I want to start here with Chris as one of our two local law enforcement people on the panel. What can Washington do here to actually help Chris? So, so I think there's already some pretty important work that's being done out of Washington, and I don't say that lightly or easily, but um, <laughs> look, you, first of all, if you're not aware of the COPS office, you should be, because the COPS office, which is part of the Justice Department, is a critical tool to provide resources, to provide training, to provide support, to really help sort of flesh out this blueprint that I was referring to. And most of the resources are available at no cost. In fact, they're very excited at working with different communities. And uh, Ron Davis, who is the director of the COPS office, was the police chief in East Palo Alto, another Bay Area city that was not without its considerable challenges and who knows of what he speaks. He has a staff of folks that are second to none in terms of providing um, all kinds of uh, guides, uh, convenings, um, technical support, subject matter experts, um, and then they have um, what a lot of us in the field refer to now, uh, perhaps euphemistically, as consent decree light, uh, which are their collaborative reform agreements. And what this looks like are communities that are really struggling, perhaps with use of force issues or breakdown between police and community, and who need let's just say some extra attention and support in order to get it right. So rather than coming in with the sort of heavy hand that let's acknowledge a consent decree is, not that that isn't also incredibly important and necessary in many cases, the collaborative reform agreement process is one where um, you sort of have a mutual understanding between the electeds, the police department, and, and the community that they need to work together with some real guidance and benchmarks that that collaborative reform agreement has on a timetable uh, with real goals as a way really to avoid a consent decree and to make things better. And there have been some amazing examples of collaborative reform agreements that have been very, very successful. They don't have to go on forever and ever um, around the country that are worth taking a look at. So COPS office, very important. But I would also, I really got to commend um, the civil rights team within the Justice Department. Uh, I, I was so privileged, and I will tell you, it was truly the high point of my professional career of 35 years to be, um, to have the chance to work with a couple of their teams, um, both in Ferguson and in Baltimore, and now doing a little work in Chicago. Because to see the dedication and the skills, I mean, these are like the all-star players of the Justice Department. And um, their understanding of how important the role they're playing in laying out a plan to help some of these cities that absolutely must recover if we're going to get it right in terms of police community relationships, I just don't think can be overstated. And, you know, so while my worst nightmare, frankly, as a police chief is having a consent decree imposed, and, I, and I'm not sure that's such a bad thing for police chiefs around the country to have nightmares about, because sometimes, you know, you are driven by the angels, and sometimes, well, it's kind of the other way around, right? And so I occasionally find myself, you know, telling folks in my department who have a hard time getting with the program that, you know, it's either work with me and the community, or, you know, would you like, uh, you know, these nice folks from the Justice Department to come in and camp out with you for a couple of years, or like, in some cases, more than a couple. We won't go into that. But, uh, I mean, that is not the ideal way to solve problems and to build relationships. But there's some places where the tough medicine is needed. You got to have it. And I will just say that this civil rights division under this administration, and I'm not even trying to be partisan here, I'm just being real, they are incredible. Um, and they, they get it, 
They are really working to accomplish the right things under some very difficult circumstances, but I'd still rather go the voluntary route. So if you can avoid any of it by building the relationships first outside of the crisis atmosphere and by coming up with your own blueprint based on the resources that are already out there through the feds and many others, um, that's really the way to go. Eric, let me turn to yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think that the federal government can play a role. We bring, um, through the Civil Rights Division, uh, lawsuits against police departments that almost always result in um, consent decrees. There is the collaborative agreements that we work out that are more informal through the, uh, through the cops' office. But then there are also, you know, forward-thinking um, chiefs. Now, when I was the deputy attorney general, I got a call from the chief of the police in Washington, D.C., who happens to be sitting to my left here, uh, Chief Ramsey, and he's always Chief Ramsey. Philadelphia just got to borrow him. He's still, he's still mine, still ours. Um, and he said that he wanted some help with regard to um, the use of force by his, um, his police officers um, and how that was having an, an impact on the relationship between the police force and the community, community they were supposed to serve. We structured um, an interaction, a program that lasted, I'm not sure exactly how long. I always wondered whether or not Chief, six maybe years. six years, okay. Um, you, wow, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always wondered whether or not you did this on your own or is this something you worked out with the mayor? Because we were always. I, I had the idea. I had the idea and I approached the mayor with the idea and he was uh, willing, because that was the first time that had ever been done, right. I'm told. And the mayor agreed, and, um, and we took a chance. And it, a lot of it had to do with you, the fact that you had served that as the U.S. attorney, uh, a judge in the district, you understood the issues and the problems that we were confronted with with trying to turn that department around. So we thought we had someone here um, in the Justice Department that really understood the extent of the problems in the district and would but respond. It was an extraordinary thing to get that call from the chief to say, you, federal government, you know, we know you, Eric, all that, that's fine. Um, but we want you to come in here and look at our department uh, and help us be, um, help us do this, do this better. I remember that just reverberated around the halls of the department. I think, really? And I said, yeah, I'm telling you, that's the call, that's the call that, that, that I got. But I think that's the kind of attitude that needs to permeate um, um, policing at the, at the state and local level. Lori, I, I just wanted to add, um, because I think the successor to a call like that uh, came under uh, Attorney General Holder in the form of the Office of Justice Programs Diagnostic Center. Oh, great. And it's, I'm not being paid, but I will tell you that has been the best thing since sliced bread for us in the city of Gary. And everywhere I go, I recommend it to mayors, to chiefs, to other communities, because it gives you an opportunity before um, the situation arises for a consent decree to really look at your department from a very um, objective point of view, but not only that, but to get the tools that you need to fix it, or at least to begin to provide the training, technical assistance, and the advice to address some, some very key issues, and, and we have been very, very fortunate in the city of Gary to have and that. And just so, so that you know, the Office of Justice Programs was headed by Lori Robinson. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank so you. I deserved all the credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, boss. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, two quick things that uh, have not yet been mentioned. One is in the uh, task force report. One we talked about on a couple of occasions, but it never made it into the, um, into the report, but it was raised again a couple weeks ago in a meeting we had uh, with the president in, uh, in Washington. Um, the first is the need for a commission to be formed to look at the entire criminal justice system, not just the focus on police. Right. The last time... The last time that was done was 1965 when Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. The majority of people on, uh, that are all protesting weren't even alive when Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. And I would argue very strongly, few things have changed since then. <laughs> and so we need to look at the entire system, 
how it works and more importantly how it doesn't work and how it impacts community and also the drivers of crime, poverty, education, all those kinds of things that really kind of you know, cause us to be in the situation that we're in now. So that's the first thing and that has to be done at some point in time. Um, the second is, and, and it came up again, I know Lori and I had a, a conversation about it uh, when we were in the middle of, uh, putting, of the task force itself, uh, but it was raised again a couple weeks ago. I do believe that federal funds should be withheld from those jurisdictions that refuse to make the kind of change that they need to make to, um, to uh, improve their police departments and their relationship with community. We can sit here and we can talk all we want, but the only thing that gets people's attention is money. Now, you won't have to do anything, but don't apply for that grant. Take it out of hide. You pay for it yourself. Raise taxes. Do whatever you got to do, but you ain't getting any federal money. If you're doing the right thing, then this is available to you. We will help you do whatever it takes to implement recommendations, to make the changes you need to make or whatever. I know that's hardball. I know that's hard for, uh, for people to kind of, in some cases, especially some elected folks to say, oh, I don't know. No, it, you either got to be serious about this or not. As I said earlier, the window of opportunity does not remain open forever. And you got folks right now that are sitting around saying, well, we'll just wait this one out. Yep. Been through here before, and you know, come and go. Let crime spike a little bit and everybody will back off and say, okay, cops, go get them. Go get them. We scared again. Go get them. Can't afford to let that kind of stuff happen, folks. But that's exactly what's going to happen if we aren't careful. Now is the time, and we have to act. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've now come to about 15 minutes before our closing, and I'm going to be turning now uh, to Q&A that questions that have been brought up from the audience. And on the first one, which is for Eric Holder, it's off the subject of policing per se, but in light of Chuck's having moved us to the broader criminal justice system, I think it's fair game here. Uh, so uh, Eric Holder, how can fair sentencing be instituted? And I know this was a subject that you spent a lot of time on during your tenure, so kick that ball to you. Well, I think, I think what uh, Commissioner Chief Ramsey said is exactly right. We have to look at this, this system of ours in its totality. And yet we've focused a great deal of attention, as we should, on, on policing. But we also have to look at the criminal justice system um, as a whole. You all have heard the numbers. You know, we're 5% of the world's population, and we're 25% of all the people who are held um, in prisons and jails. Um, we incarcerate about 700 people per 100,000 or so. Our closest um, to that is Russia, you know? And they're at about 500. And everybody else is, is way below. We have, um, we have a problem of over-incarceration. Um, you know, we have put in place these mandatory minimum sentences that takes discretion away from judges so that a judge looking at a particular defendant um, and making a decision. I was a judge in Washington, D.C., and it's one of the reasons I left the bench, because I didn't like the fact that I could have a case tried before me, look at a particular defendant, and have in my own mind what I thought an appropriate sentence was. I mean, yeah, the person needed to go to jail, but the person did need to go to jail for 10, 15 years for something where I thought maybe the sentence ought to be, ought to be three years. So I think that in a practical way, you know, um, rolling back these use of mandatory minimum sentences. Um, I, we put out when I was at the Justice Department as part of this Smart on Crime initiative, um, giving more discretion to, um, to prosecutors as to what charges they would bring. Under my predecessor, uh, John Ashcroft, he said that every prosecutor within the Department of Justice had to bring, as a matter of policy, um, the charge that would uh, ge engender the greatest amount, the greatest amount of jail time. You know, just what you, just what you had to do. And you know, that's, and I reversed that in, um, in, in 2010 and said to prosecutors, you make an individualized determination about what um, an appropriate <laughs> charge is. So I, I think there are a variety of mechanisms that can be, that can be used. 
uh, to keep the American people safe while at the same time reducing the number of people who are in jail, um, which will reduce costs, which will engender greater faith in the criminal justice system. But I really want to emphasize, uh, as we've seen this done on the state levels, um, you don't see crime go up. In fact, in some places you've seen um, crime go down if you couple these criminal justice reform efforts with um, reentry efforts so that you're dealing, and this is something that, Laurie, you certainly um, championed as the head of OJP, the Office of Justice Programs, um, helping people reenter society, giving, you know, dealing with those social deficits uh, that played a large role in why they became involved in the criminal justice system at all. You know, you can't expect to take people out of a bad situation when they have committed crimes, put them in jail, simply warehouse them, don't do anything for them, and then put them back into the same environment and expect a different result. You know, that's why we have this, um, this high rate of recidivism. So I think a lot can be done when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, the larger systemic problems that, um, that we confront. And you know, we, we talk about how there is a moment in time. We have an, it is amazing to me that this is something that Congress has not dealt with. We have Republicans as well as Democrats, liberals as well as um, conservatives, the Koch brothers as well as the, um, the ACLU, everybody's saying that we need to do this. And yet, because of the paralysis in Washington, D.C., you have three or four bills that are floating around that a senator told me last night that are opposed by about four or five senators, and it's not going to happen this year. And that, to me, just makes no sense. Um, these folks have ideological and political cover to simply do the right thing, and they need to do it. Uh, thank you. Next question. In terms of transparency, what do you think is the best policy regarding the release of video and police shootings, other serious uh, types of force, or uses of force, rather, and everyday police citizen interventions, or interactions, rather, can't read the writing. Uh, so this would, would be with regard to uh, body-worn cameras. Um, Brittany? I, I'm a little scared to speak, because apparently I like ruffle too many feathers. Um, <laughs> oh, go for it, Brittany. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I just want to say about, about this federal piece, too, um, I really appreciate what you said because we would rather <laughs> police departments go the voluntary route as well, right? Because the choice that was put in front of folks in Ferguson when the city council was deciding whether or not to approve the consent decree, pe there were people on all sides of this issue because it threatens to bankrupt Ferguson, right? Because it's gotten to this point. And so the divisions weren't straight down racial lines, right? There were people who were saying, well, what about the services that we receive from the city. Um, and so that real challenge wouldn't have been there had they faced up to the music far before we reached a level of crisis. Um, and, I, and I think that you know this conversation represents a great deal of progress, right? I mean, I think everyone in the room are reasonable people. And to be sitting in between two members of law enforcement and talking about what we agree on much more than what we disagree on represents a great deal of progress over the last two years. And I don't want us to take that for granted. Um, but about this question about videos, you know, we talked about that a lot during the during the task force time um, because there are multiple challenges, right? There's this challenge of trauma, um, and there's a challenge of pr privacy. And when you talk to a lot of people in marginalized communities, they feel a lot of different ways about body cameras because on the one hand, people think it's going to increase transparency. On the other hand, people think it will increase uh, surveillance, right? Um, and so then you have to have those kinds of conversations with people. Um, but I think that what we have to be careful to do is however we decide to move forward with body cameras, we cannot have it absent, be absent of the conversations of how then these cases continue to move forward. Because if we see more videos and afterwards there is no justice, we will continue to see this situation inflamed, right? So it's not just about whether or not we have access to the video, it's about what that police department, what that union, what the criminal justice system decides to do in terms of accountability thereafter, that it has to be a part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Other comments? I, yeah, so just a couple of thoughts about video because let's, you know, this is sort of for many places, it's interesting to watch how police body cameras have become kind of the instant 
um, answer. You just issue everybody a body camera and you're good. And that's so far from the case, uh, you know. And I think the points that, that Brittany raises are right on point. There are real issues, um, frankly, that both police and community members, as well as adv advocacy groups, even the ACLU, which was an early proponent of body cameras, is now sort of stepping back and saying, well, wait a minute, we got, as it turns out, there's some things about this that we're very concerned about. But we, but we really have to, uh, I think this is a good example of even where internal procedural justice within a police department becomes an issue. We have to have real conversations with our officers as much as with our community about how we're going to use body cameras. Just even putting aside the legal and logistical considerations that involve unions and the way they influence these decisions, their laws sprouting up all around the country about this. But we really have to think about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And we also have to recognize that a camera is just one perspective, even of an issue. So the idea somehow that with a body camera, now you're going to see everything that happened with an incident is false. We've gotta be real about what the limitations of this technology are. It's, iron it's ironic that you know, in some of the conversations we're having with our police union, um, in, in Tucson, we've been arguing with them that the officer should have to give a statement and write a report before he or she watches the camera footage, and they're not in favor of that. Yet what they don't understand is, and what a number of other unions are sort of starting to figure out is that maybe that's not actually the position that's in their own best interest. Because what an officer may perceive involves not just one narrow view from a body camera that may be positioned here on their chest, to what's going on, but a whole series of things that are happening in a 360 degree environment around them, and it is to their advantage to be able to recall and describe that without having to feel pigeoned in by watching a video and then trying to conform a statement to what that one narrow perspective shows. But I guess my point is, the cameras are an example of technology in policing that they are a valuable tool. I'm a supporter of them just as I believe, for example, electronic uh, you know, control devices, ECDs like Taser have a place as well. But what we've discovered over and over again is none of these technologies or tools in and of themselves are the whole answer. We have to be talking with our communities about how we wanna use them. We have to develop thoughtful policies. We have to recognize that there is a downside to all of them, and we have to understand that none of them are a substitute, again, to this underlying concept of communication, face-to-face -face communication and relationship building and actual dialogue about tough subjects. We, technology is not going to shortcut that process for us. It can aid us with issues of transparency. I believe it has value but in and of itself, it is not a simple answer, and it has to really be done in a thoughtful way. Also because, I mean, and I'll perhaps state they're very obvious here, but this stuff is incredibly expensive. Oh my goodness, the cameras are only the start of the cost. For those of you connected with the city or a police department, where do you, how do you think this data is being stored? It sounds nice, doesn't it? In the cloud. You know how expensive the cloud is? I mean, this can bankrupt a city. So I mean, we have, we have real issues we gotta figure out as we gradually roll some of these things out. Yeah, and I should say not to mention the, the person who might well be a lawyer who has to review all of that material. Oh, right. totally. uh, that's extraordinarily expensive. Chuck? I'll try to keep my comments very brief because I know we're running out of time, but one of the things, when some people that read our task force report were a little disappointed we didn't spend more time talking about body cameras. But that, we made a conscious decision not to. The reason is because today we're talking about body cameras. Tomorrow it'll be some other technology that we're, that we're dealing with. Technology is advancing faster than policy or the law can keep pace with. And so we need to have these conversations up front. We need the Bar Association. We need the ACLU. We need community organizations. We need police professionals to sit down and think this stuff through. You know, everybody right now is in love with body cameras. 
How long do you think it's going to take before some manufacturer says, I got something now, I'll put facial recognition on the body camera. Now a cop's walking on that beat and he stops you and say, yo, when's the last time you paid child support? Because that warrant pops, all right? How much are you going to love it then? What about the other privacy issues? I don't know about you, but my house is not always in order to a point where I want everybody seeing and going into my house. People call 911 because they have a problem not to say good morning. And so do you really want your neighbors seeing and hearing everything that's going on? So what's appropriate to be shared versus what's not appropriate to be shared? I mean, we need to really think about this stuff. It is not easy. Now, there are times when it should be, you know, released. Uh, we have to work with our district attorneys and prosecutors and others to make sure we don't compromise cases. But we need to be thoughtful when we have this and not just say, well, let's throw it out there for transparency, okay? Because we, we could get ourselves in trouble here. But we need to have serious discussion around the application of technology in the hands of police. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. And so, you, whether you're talking about drones, whether you're talking about robots, whether you're talking about body cameras, facial recognition, all this, I'm not saying this stuff's bad. I'm saying, folks, we need to think about this because it is different when it comes in the hands of law enforcement. And, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to get in a database. The hard thing is getting out. Mm. And you need to think about that. How long do we retain this stuff when we know that there's no criminal activity associated with whatever. These are serious issues that we've got to come to grips with and the time to do it is not wait till we get a case that winds up in the Supreme Court. We need to have these discussions now. Well, Chuck, that's a very apt note to end on. Uh, I hope all of you will join me in thanking this terrific panel. <laughs>